Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me each week is a guy who knows that every fight is a food fight when you are a cannibal. He is the captain. It's good to see you, Clarice. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Circus City IPA by Big Top Brewing Company. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. Hoppy, malty, and smooth. And I would say a little sweet as well. It's like a circus in your mouth. 6.8 ABV. Check out Big Top Brewing because they are brewing some damn good beers. And this fantastic brew was brought to us by this crazy crew. First up, a big thank you to Carrie in Royal Oak, Michigan. And a big shout out to Paige from Zionsville, Indiana. Also, we have Amy from Reno, Nevada. Also in Reno, we have a shout out to Alex. And a big we like your jib to Aaron in Lyons, Colorado. Next, we have Mike in Chicago who says, thanks guys for saving the world one garage at a time. Chicago. And last but not least, we have Terry Ann in Sunnyside, Washington. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's beer run, Go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you would like a We Like Your Jib shirt, we have them in a a t-shirt and a tank top. You can get those now, but that's a limited number, and they're almost sold out. So get to the website. We only have three of them. Two and a half. (laughs) We're selling two and a half. Oh, just sold one. But lucky for you guys, we just sold one of the half ones. So there's two left. (laughs) So go to truecrimegarage.com, check out the store page, and check out our blog. And if you want to follow us on social media, we are at True Crime Garage. That's enough of the business, Captain. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Jasper, Texas. After breakfast, people walk to work or the church to hear the pastor's message. On a roll called Huff Creek, found it tough to speak because what they saw left them gasping and breathless. The broken body of bird. In short, you probably heard the story is rather gory, and if you follow the words, you can somewhat get a picture. But can you really picture being chained up into a pickup truck and drug until the street ripped your arm off and decapitate you? And the ones who perpetrated this act for the simple fact that you were black, they had to hate you. Mad at nature, cause she made you beautiful. And that's irrefutable. Like the fact that crack street pharmaceuticals is genocide to blacks. And although this attack on bird left the whole world disturbed, a few years back, it was common and not unusual for other brothers to get done like that. And the irony of it all, y'all, was Bird was often heard saying that he would put Jasper, Texas on the map. But Jasper, Texas put him on the map, figuratively and literally. In spite of the insanity of this calamity, his family refused to respond bitterly. And considering the circumstances, what riddles me is, we rallied to save the killers, but who rallied to save Bird? This week's case takes place back in 1998 in the small town of Jasper. The city's website says Jasper is located in deep east Texas. So Jasper is about 130 miles northeast of the city of Houston, and it's pretty close to the Louisiana border. The town is named after William Jasper, a war hero from the American Revolution. 
He was killed when attempting to plant the American flag at the storming of Savannah in 1779. The town is only about 10 square miles. And back in 1998, about 8,000 people lived there. Jasper calls itself the jewel of the forest. James Byrd Jr. was born in Beaumont, Texas back in 1949. So in 1998, Byrd was 49 years old. James was part of a large family, um, including James. There were nine kids in his family, Mm -hmm. and James Byrd Jr. was named after his father. In 1967, Byrd was in the last segregated class to graduate from Jasper High School. Uh, before it was consolidated with Jasper High as part of the desegregation plan. He married in 1970. He had three children. Uh, his children's names were Renee, Ross, and Jamie. So two girls and one boy uh, before divorcing in 1993. Between 1969 and 1996, James Bird was incarcerated a couple of times for various small-time offenses, including theft, forgery, and violation of parole. James Byrd was described as a fixture in Jasper, someone that most people of the town knew either by name or because he often could be seen walking around the town. Mm -hmm. James Byrd, he did not drive because of a disability. He suffered from seizures, which would not allow him to operate a vehicle. Yeah, I think every town has the walker or the runner. Or the bicycle guy. Yeah. We had, uh, in our small town growing up, there was the, it wasn't a tricycle, but it was like a, it was adult tricycle. Well, it's, it's technically a tricycle, even though it's made for yeah, a, yeah. a but fully it wasn't, grown person. It wasn't like a big wheel. Was right? was this a basket and a flag? Yeah. In yeah. every, I mean, the fully outfitted tricycle. Yeah. That was the guy in our town growing up. He was like everywhere. And when I lived in Richmond, Indiana, we had the runner. Mm-hmm. It was just this guy that just ran everywhere, like super fast. And then when when he was at like a traffic light mm-hmm. waiting to cross the street, he'd still run in place. He was like probably in the best shape of anybody in the history of the world. Now, I live in North Columbus, so a lot more people, so a lot more runners. There's not just the one runner guy. There's not just the you know, the one Walker guy, Mm -hmm. uh, there's bunches of them. However, there's a couple of what I would call quote unquote bicycle guys. And there's one guy that I've learned a tendency that he has, like he doesn't because the sidewalk ends does not mean that's where he's going to stop. (laughs) So he will, he will like pull up and he'll, he'll keep going just past the curb. And so he's out in the street. Hmm. Um, you know, just partially out into the street. So when people are driving, when I'm riding shotgun and I see that bicycle guy, I have to point out, like, be careful if you're going to turn here because he will be in the street. Yeah. And I don't think he knows any better not to get hit by the car that's, that's approaching. Well, I'm bringing this up is just to prove the point that a town can really know somebody, uh, or somebody could be very popular in the town just because he's known as all oh, that James bird. He's, the guy you always see out walking. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and that's how, that's how he was. I mean, he became a fixture of Jasper. People either knew him by name or they knew him from seeing him out walking around. And he was known as like a happy dude. He's a happy guy, mm-hmm. uh, known as a musician and singer. James played the piano at church when he was growing up. Uh, he played the trumpet in school. And as an adult, he loved to attend parties where he would often sing in front of small crowds at these parties. He fancied himself like a, like an Al Green type singer. Mm-hmm. And several people say Purple Rain must have been one of James Bird's favorite songs because he was always singing it. Uh, so known as a, a music man and for his singing and dancing. It's a great song. It's one of my bar songs. I like to put it on. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's, it's a little sad. You know, kind of brings down the party and... It's fun also to look around at the sea of people wondering who put this song on. Well, and if you play it late enough, a lot of people start singing along to that song. No, I like to play it at like nine. Okay. Like where everybody's like, what? This is too early. (laughs) We're not ready for it. This is like four hours too early. So back in 1998, James Bird Jr. would have been 49 years old. And as we said, Captain, he's like a man about town. 
You know, mm-hmm. he's the guy that everybody would have known him by name or by seeing him around town. And happy guy, good natured guy, very sociable, very sociable. I that that's the exact phrase that we should have used right there. Well, and he comes from a very small town, but he also comes from a big family. So yeah. let's listen to a clip of his mother Stella talking about James. He, he was, uh, you know, he was around. And so he's missed very much. Just reason we haven't had any more family reunions because it's just a part of it just missing. I guess it always uh, would be like that. I just had two boys and all the rest of the girls. And so he was the third child. And the girls and most of all, all the, just looked up to him for different things because he was the big brother of the sisters and he would just keep your life and you just he just liked people and most musicians whether i mean not all musicians like people uh but no, some lock themselves in closets yes <laughs> <laughs> i've been known to do that um but you become social and you get you get good at social skills mm-hmm. you know so there's a lot of times that if there's a big crowd of people some people will come up to me and say, "Hey, you're pretty good at this." And it's like, "But, but you, I've been doing it forever." Mm-hmm. So you you play your set, and then in between your sets, you're you're mingling with people, shaking hands, and and having some drinks. So, so you, he, uh, James, very active with his family. You know, mm-hmm. a good big brother. Very, you know, stayed close with his parents and with his uh, siblings. And like you hear his mother saying, you know, he just liked people. He liked he liked everyone. Um, and yeah, and I think happy go lucky kind of dude, uh, he, he was a musician that still had some big dreams Mm -hmm. and some pretty big goals. And even though he was 49, it was almost like, um, he didn't let that block his vision or block his goals. He would always state that he was going to put Jasper, Texas on the map Mm -hmm. and uh, doing so through his music. Now we have to talk about some other guys here, unfortunately, but we could not tell the whole story without introducing some guys and giving a little background. First, we have Sean Allen Barry, born February 12th, 1975. So in 1998, he would be 23 years old. And we have an old friend of his, John William King. John William King went by Bill. So to make it easy on me, that's that's what I'll call him. So Bill King would have been 23 years old as well in 98. Mm-hmm. Bill, as a child, he was diagnosed as uh, manic depressive. Uh, by 98, these two had known each other for over, well, for about 10 years. In fact, they went to school together. So this is a lengthy uh, friendship between these two. So Sean Barry, his father died when he was just a kid, and he dropped out of school in the eighth grade. It's believed that about this time that he went and he was living somewhat on the streets. Uh, he wasn't close to his mother. Uh, so we, after we see his father passing away, we see his family life just, I mean, Falling gone. Apart, yeah. It's just gone. We have Bill King who dropped out of school in the 10th grade. Uh, the two actually got into trouble together. In 1991, the two broke into a warehouse. They were caught and they were sent to a boot camp style to be um, sent off to this boot camp type of thing to be Mm. reformed. Both completed this boot camp. Both received probation afterwards. Jerry Springer style, right? Yeah, yeah. So Sean Barry, he had little to no trouble with following the rules and doing what was expected of him while on probation. Bill King, well, not so much. Mm -hmm. Bill King violated his probation he gets caught with drugs, and so he so he ends up in prison. And Bill is the one that was diagnosed with manic depression. Correct. So Correct. maybe possibly self-medicating through um, the drugs. Yeah, yeah, very likely. Bill gets caught with these drugs. He goes to prison. Mm-hmm. And while he's in prison, he met this guy named Lawrence Russell Brewer. He just goes by Russell. Okay, so Russell Brewer is about eight years older than Bill. Mm-hmm. Brewer is one of these always in and out of prison kind of dudes, you know, so a, a real winner. Mm-hmm. Um, Brewer had been in and out of prison for a little more than 10 years. He had served 
a prison sentence for drug possession and burglary. He was paroled in 1991. Uh, after violating his parole conditions in 1994, Brewer was returned to prison. According to Brewer, while he was in prison, he joined a white supremacist gang mm -hmm. with Bill King in order to safeguard himself from other inmates. Brewer and King became friends in the uh, what's called the Beto unit prison. This is this is supposed to be a pretty um, it's rumored to be a very tough prison. Right. You see this a lot in Hollywood movies where you, if, if you ever watch American His History X, for example, but where you you have to team up with somebody. Mm hmm. Uh, and so that's kind of what his cop out is as well. We only teamed up with the white supremacists for protection. Yeah. I mean, there's no secret that there's the white gang and there's the Latino gang mm -hmm. and there's the African American gang. Um, so yeah, he's, he's teaming up or getting involved in this group to, you know, to protect himself is what he claims. Right now, Bill King claimed that he had been gang raped in prison uh, at some point during his stay by African American inmates. So is this before or after he joined the white supremacist? All right, this is going to sound crazy, but I came across this newspaper article and I have to talk about this to kind of, cause you know, when we research these cases, you take in a lot of information. And if sometimes if you don't, if you don't push that information out, it gets stuck with you and it stays with you. And I don't know how, the Washington Post knows this information, but today, Captain, you're going to be my you're going to be my therapist, and I'm going to lay this on you, so oh, I don't have no. to carry it around with There's me. There's not anymore. enough booze in this garage. So, according to the Washington Post article that I read last night, mm -hmm. the way that this went down is Bill King. He would have been fairly young when he entered the prison system. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, he was a smaller dude, like about 140. Uh, 140 pounds, according to this Washington Post article. What they say in this article is that the the inmates had managed to kind of divvy themselves up, like you had said, into their different gangs, and they kind of occupied different portions of the prison. Mm -hmm. um, not really segregated, but kind of self-segregation, uh, people staying away from one another, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... There was an area that was predominantly African American. Um, and it, according to the article, it's African American gang um, area in this prison. The white supremacist group had some kind of involvement with the guards or some form of relationship with the guards that they were able to manipulate the system when a, when a young white guy, small white, white guy like Bill King came into the prison. Right. I'm sissy. Loser. They, they would they would influence the guards in some way that they could put that young man with either the Latino gang area or the African American gang area. Right. Probably hand jobs and cigarettes. Um uh, I, I don't I d <laughs> I don't know how it came about, but this is according to the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. This could all be complete bullshit for all I know, because it's, it's, it's a strange story. It's, it's like a double crossed weird psychological story here. So the white supremacist put this young white dude with a different group, with the African American group with, the, with the purpose that he would be abused in some fashion by these guys. And that would influence him to come running to want to join their silly little club that they have. Right. According to the Washington post, that's how this whole thing went down. So it would have been, he would have been attacked. Uh, and according to the article, it was multiple times. And then eventually he ended up with this white supremacist group. All right. So what happens next with these, uh, losers? Uh, could, would you mind terribly if we circled the wagons back there and, and talked about that newspaper article? Uh, sure. it, it, and the reason being is that, the reason why I kept saying, according to the Washington post, it's a horrific story, but you know, you referenced Hollywood movies earlier and how they portray prison. And it sounds to me like a very kind of Hollywood version of what could be going on in this prison. I'm not saying that none of this stuff happened, right? but what I'm, what I question when I read that article is where are they getting this information from? 
because I don't know who it, out of any of those groups that were mentioned in the article that would come forward with that information. Right. And maybe they're getting this from Bill King himself. And if so, it's, you know, it's just an excuse is all it is. But, you know. well, I get, I get that it's an excuse and maybe it did come from Bill King, but then isn't that like, because Bill King is like, a, it, it, he's proud to be a racist and he's proud to be in this white supremacist group. Right. Okay. But this group, according to the story, double crossed you and made you a victim so that you would join their group. It seems like the last group you would want to join if that's how they create their members. Yeah, but he's he's a sissy. He needed somebody to protect him. No, 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 no. I, I get that portion of it. What I'm saying is that, that f- I, I don't trust this story because I don't know how they would have got this information. Because no matter who would tell you this story out of any of those groups, they're putting themselves in a horrible light. You know what I mean? They're putting themselves as being the bad guy. There yeah. is no good guy in that story. So where did, I don't know where they got the information. Well, right. And I think even talking about it more than we should is, is giving some, uh, you know, justification for, for him to think these horrible thoughts and to be racist. So while in prison, both Brewer and King, they got in this white supremacist group, uh, while still locked up, Bill King started to write letters to his old buddy, Sean Barry, who was on the outside, as they say. In these letters, Bill used a lot of prison slang, some that Sean Barry says he was familiar with and some that he was not. But in these letters that Sean would... This is where Sean would learn of what he calls a change in his longtime friend uh, Bill's behavior. Mm -hmm. Bill started talking about his white supremacy. Uh, Bill spoke of his hatred for African-Americans and Jewish people. Sean said that Bill sent him four letters while he was in prison and he would end up, he would end these letters by referring to Sean Barry as his Aryan brother. Mm. And I thought you were going to say he like, you know, did some kissy faces or something. Well, this, this one seems silly. He, he would also say things like, like, uh, stay white. Uh, (laughs) So, yeah, I felt sorry. I know this is not really a case where we should be laughing, but no, just but I mean, such yeah, a hey, dorky. Hey, stay white. Seems brother. like a dorky thing to say. Stay, uh, white. stay, stay white. And, uh, I woke up today and again, I'm white. You know, stay white. Jeez. Sean, Sean says that he didn't care much for that kind of talk, uh, stating that he did not write. Uh, back to Bill King. He didn't send Bill King any return letters. He didn't do any kissy faces. Or yeah, send a send an or up, stay white, st- stay white back at you, repl- right back at you. Reply ya. with an update uh, regarding his whiteness. Um, eventually, Bill gets out of prison and he goes back to Jasper, Texas. Mm-hmm. And when he returns, he starts hanging out with his old buddy Sean Barry. This is another weird thing. It's like okay, you got this guy writing you all these letters, saying all these things that you don't care for. Mm-hmm. Yet when he returns to town, you're like, hey. How's it going? It's a let's another, hang out. It's just another excuse and a horrible um, trying to explain away what you, what you are. So Sean Barry says that once Bill got back, uh, he made it. Bill made it pretty well known that he did not like African Americans, Jewish people, or Asian people. Bill King was also sporting so it some. Like, it seems like his hatred keeps growing. Well, his possible now, now he hates Asians. His possible. Uh, friendship pool just got a lot smaller right so bill king is also sporting some racist tattoos as well i'm sure those look amazing mm-hmm. and I, and I, are I, they on his face you can no oh. no they're on mostly like his chest and arms and some on his back and you can find them online um no nobody needs to there, that. there's a there's a lot of pictures of them i don't care really to describe them here but then eventually Lawrence Russell Brewer, uh, Russell Brewer gets out of prison and he goes to Jasper as well. So now we have the Jasper three. So by now it's almost the middle of the year of 1998. Um, we, as we said, Brewer to Brewer is covered in these racist tattoos as well on the face. Um, not on the face. Mm. So Sissy. by, I mean, if you, if you're going to go for it, you know, 
put it right on the face. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to be an idiot, just put it right on your face. Yeah, I mean, so, so by why June, hide it? June of 1998, these three guys are sharing an apartment. Sean Barry, Bill King, and Russell Brewer. And this goes down like this. So it's it's technically Bill King's apartment. Mm. Okay. Sean Barry had a girlfriend that he at this time would have uh, had at least one child with, maybe two. But I think it was one of those one, you know, has one kid and one on the way situation. Mm-hmm. Sean and his lady friend were having some trouble and they were on the outs. So Sean goes to stay with Bill King. Sean Barry at this time is working as a manager at a movie theater. Then we have Russell Brewer. He is just fresh out of prison. It's like the last week or second to last week of May that he got out of prison and he headed out to Jasper to catch up with Bill King and stay there with him for a while. Now, Bill King wants to organize a white supremacy chapter or group in Jasper, Texas. This is the Texas Rebels Soldier Division of the Confederate Knights of America. And Russell Brewer is going to be the first member or hold a high rank. I'm not really sure how that stuff works. It sounds like these three idiots living together in this apartment, it's pretty much like a loud, drunk, three-man party every night Mm. because at some point, the landlady had got sick of the noise in the late, drunken nights, and Bill King was facing an eviction from his apartment. Let's get right back to the James Bird case right after this quick beer break. All right, cheers, mates. On Saturday, June 6, 1998, James Bird Jr., he spent the day drinking and socializing with friends and family in Jasper, Texas. He was at his niece's bridal shower. This celebration was being held at Bird's parents' house. After the bridal shower, James walked to a friend's house for an anniversary party. So this is a good Saturday, Captain, a long day filled with Three of my favorite things, friends, food, and drinks. Mm -hmm. And at the party, James was just being James. You know, he was seen laughing and joking around with everyone, singing and dancing. He sounds like a good timing man that, you know, happy-go-lucky and ready to put everyone in a good mood. Yeah, one thing that a lot of people don't know about the colonel is the colonel likes to dance after a couple drinks. (laughs) Do the old colonel shuffle. Um, so, (laughs) so his friends, so his, at his friend's home, this would have been across town from James's apartment. It sounds like he would have left his friend's house quite late that night. Mm -hmm. There's some varied accounts of what time this would have been, but it was, it was late sometime after 1am, you know? So we have people who've been partying all day. There's no wonder that there's a little bit of a question as to what time, Mr. Bird left the party. Now, roughly at about the same time, we have Bill King, Russell Brewer, and Sean Barry. They had spent the evening at a party as well, but not any of the same parties as James Bird. Right. I'm not really sure how these guys are getting invited to a party, but anyway, that's that's what they were doing. So apparently they left this party uh, because a a young African-American woman arrived at that same party. And this, it's reported that Bill and Russell got upset at seeing the new guest at the party and became enraged, angered, and very loud. Uh, So they probably stormed out of this party. From there, they spent some time drinking and driving. So Sean Barry had an old gray pickup truck. And they were driving around in his pickup truck, drinking beers and, you know, looking to pick up women, I guess. Yeah, and probably holding hands and stuff. So James Bird left, and he's going to be walking home. And now we have these three guys driving around in the pickup truck, drinking their beers. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along James's walk home, a truck with these three guys in it pulls up, and they offer him a ride. So from my understanding, having never been there, but the way that I believe Jasper is laid out is that you have um, the east side and the west side which is divided by highway 96 and remember we said he was 
James Bird was at an event taking place on one side of town and across the other side of town was his apartment. So at some point, James had to walk along Highway 96 to get to his apartment. Mm -hmm. That's where he encountered Sean Barry, Bill King, and Russell Brewer in the primer gray pickup truck. Right, and this is not a good thing. I mean, this is not going to be good for James Bird because, one, he doesn't know that he's getting offered a ride by three white supremacists. He doesn't know that these white supremacists were at some party and left because a, a black woman showed up. Yeah, he doesn't know who, who he's getting in the truck with. They offer him a ride. James Bird accepts the offer, and as you said, Captain, he gets in the truck with Bill King, Russell Brewer, and Sean Barry. Now, Bill King and not Russell, but... Sean Barry? Sean Barry. They are from Jasper. Yes. So there's a very good chance that they know who James Bird is, or at least know him as, oh, this is the guy that you see walking a lot. Very likely they have seen him before. Now, about 7 a.m. on Sunday, June 7th, a call goes out to police. There is a body that has been found in the road near a cemetery. The early belief was this was a hit and run type situation. The responding officer quickly noticed dark marks on the road as he got near the location of where the body was found. The officer, this is uh, Sheriff Rolls. Mm -hmm. He says he followed that mark for the entirety of the crime scene. Thinking, you know, while he's checking this out, he's thinking to himself, this is going to be the easiest hit and run case that we have ever had because he was going to be able to follow what he believed to be tire marks all the way to the guilty party's house or to at least the location of the vehicle that was involved. Hmm. The officer had followed the tracks for about two miles. He and the other officer started to notice that this was not tire marks like they had thought. This was a brown, what they refer to as a brown-like substance. When they got to the end of the marks, the officers found shoes, a tank top, dentures, and a billfold. In the billfold, they found the ID card of one James Bird Jr. Sheriff Rolls is pretty, he's now pretty aware that this is not a hit and run. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he is dealing with. This is a murder case. um, And the victim had been, he could tell by what he was seeing captain that because the original thought is that whoever the victim was, which turns out to be James bird, right? He would, maybe he was crossing the street and somebody didn't see him. They hit him and the damage done to the body that they found would have occurred being, having rolling underneath the vehicle as it passed over top of him. Right. Or you've seen cases, um, with, you know, even like, um, state troopers or highway patrol where they get hit by a car, but they actually get locked into that car and, and, and they're dragged for a little bit. Yeah. Well, but, but their initial thought is that, that this person was run over. There was initial damage from being rolled underneath the vehicle as the vehicle passed over them and then left the remains there. Right. However, as they're following these tracks and as they're starting to piece this thing together, they're finding evidence that it's, that it is, this person was dragged. They weren't, they weren't hit. And then, and then the person took off. Right. They're seeing evidence that this person had actually been pulled behind a vehicle and dragged to death along this stretch of road. While they are checking out the items uh, that they have located, all of which they believe to belong to the victim, mm-hmm. a woman comes forward at and tells the sheriff and his officer that she has found a head and an arm near her home. Mm-hmm. So the head and arm were found about one mile from where the torso was located. The head was in such bad condition and so destroyed from the dragging that they had to use fingerprints to identify the body. And after checking the fingerprints, they confirmed that this is, this was, in fact, the body of 49-year-old James Bird Jr. So law enforcement's going to find some items from James Bird. They're also going to find some other items. 
Yeah, this is at a small clearing in in the woods, um, which is just right off the of, uh, off of the road. If anybody's watched any videos or seen uh, the the road that was traveled in Jasper, Texas, I mean, there's trees along both sides of the road. Mm-hmm. This is a small, thin country road that we're talking about here. But in a small clearing, the investigators uh, believe that there was a fight in this clearing because of upturned grass, disturbed dirt and broken beer bottles. So they are seeing signs of what they believe to be a struggle Mm -hmm. in the clearing. The investigators also found several items. So this is evidence and this evidence includes cigarette butts, uh, the beer bottles, like we had said, a wrench with the word Barry inscribed on it. Mm. We also have a lighter, that's inscribed with the word possum and some kind of KKK symbol. They also found some eyewitnesses. So witnesses came forward reporting having, having seen James Byrd Jr. riding in the bed of a gray or light colored pickup truck right. with two or three men in the cab between 2.30 and 2.45 a.m. This is some stuff that I love here, Captain. Here is some small town, good old fashioned police work. An officer tells the sheriff, hey, Sean Barry has a light gray colored pickup truck. Right. Well, they found, you know, they have the wrench with the word Barry Barry on it. it. They have witnesses seeing a light colored pickup truck. This is just when, when you live in a small town like this, like you said, most people knew James Bird from having seen him walking. A lot of people knew each other. Everybody kind of knows what's going on. You find a couple couple clues, you put two and two together, and you got Not, somebody to talk to right away. Right. Again, Jasper is a town of maybe 10 miles. Yeah. And then when you have a crime that you know that whatever went down is one of the most horrific crimes maybe ever, uh, definitely ever in Jasper, as law enforcement, I think you're – your initial fear is that you need to have this solved mm-hmm. and quickly. Uh, fortunately for them, there is a bunch of evidence that is left. Now, uh, let, talking about, you know, good old fashioned police work, we have mm-hmm. Sheriff Rolls. He's the one that's heading the investigation. And you talked about it being a small town and one of the worst murders ever. I don't know how many years as sheriff. Rolls had under his belt by 98. Mm -hmm. He comes off in, in interviews that I've seen with him as a pretty seasoned, um, police officer, a pretty seasoned sheriff, Mm -hmm. uh, and investigator at that as well. But in one interview, you know, he's asked is, is this the most horrific murder you've ever seen? And he said, well, you know, in my time in Jasper, first of all, every murder is horrific. However, in his time, he had only worked two murder cases up to this point. Right. And he said, if I had to pick the murder of James Byrd Jr. would be the worst one that I've ever seen. So, well, easily for him. But I, like I said, I mean, I, I think it did, is did not. it did it goes past those boundaries that it goes past the, right. the, the city limits of Jasper. I, I get you. I get you. So, we have this officer that brings up that information to the sheriff. We have Sean Barry. He has a light gray colored truck. So they go pick up Sean Barry that afternoon. That's right. They find the victim at approximately 7 a.m. on that Sunday. Mm-hmm. And it's by that afternoon that, that they've picked up a guy and they're already hitting him with some hard questions. They actually arrest him on some type of traffic violations. He must have had outstanding speeding tickets or parking tickets, God knows what, but they pick him up on these traffic violations. Then according to the police, well, he had an outstanding warrant for being a (laughs) douchebag. According to the police, they got some info from some women in these guys lives. So at about four or 5 AM, the three guys, uh, Sean Barry, Bill King, Russell Brewer, they showed up at uh, Bill King's, I'm guessing his girlfriend's house or mm-hmm. place. I'm unclear as to the details of the relationship, but the two had a child together, okay? Okay. Uh, Baby she, mama. Yes. Mm-hmm. And when the sheriff's department, when they go to talk with her, 
she identifies the lighter that they found, the lighter that has the word possum in the KKK thing on it uh, as Bill's lighter. And she tells them that the three men showed up at her place, like we said, about 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning, and they stayed there that night. Right, and and the thing about the possum is that that was Bill's nickname uh, because he was King, Bill King. They called him Possum King. Okay, that makes sense. So she identified the lighter as belonging to Bill. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to have all three of these guys in custody. And they're not, they're not charging them with anything yet because they don't really fully know what's gone down or if these guys are in fact guilty of anything. When they rounded these guys up, this is another weird part of this story that you come across. They found that the, the guys were in possession of some form of stolen property. Mm -hmm. So they're going to kind of hold that over their heads and use that for means to hold them as long, you know, longer so they can speak with these guys. And right. figure out what happened. Well, and all these guys have a record. They're just, I mean, they're, they're small time criminals is what they truly are. I, I mean, until this point in the story, mm. but they're, they're bad at it. Like they're not, they're not smart. They don't get away with anything. You know what I mean? Like, well, they, yeah, well yeah, you can tell, I mean, they're, they're racist and, and by definition that makes them ignorant people. Yeah. But they can't even be good at committing crime. I mean, they get picked up for all these small time things. And then this possession of stolen property, what we're talking about here is there was a restaurant that was broken into, uh, days before this event happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when, when they were going through these men's belongings after having arrested them and speaking with them, they found them to be in possession of, of stolen frozen meat that was from that location. Right. So they, I mean, they couldn't prove that they had broke into the restaurant, right, but, but it have, looks like, yeah, it's not like if you went into my freezer right now and you said, man, there's a bunch of Wendy's patties in here. <laughs> Where did you get those? How'd oh, that I, happened. I bought them at the store. I'm good friends um, with Wendy. They probably said, uh, why do you guys have all this meat here? And they said, well, you know, we need some extra money so we could get our, our, our sheets together so we could cut some holes in them to make some Ku Klux Klan hats. That's what we want to do. So they're holding these guys, they're holding them and questioning all three of them, obviously separately, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what had happened that night, or maybe, and this is what they're probably really trying to do, Captain, you know this, I know this, a lot of the listeners out there know this, what they're probably trying to do is to get these guys to start turning on one another. Right. Well, Barry, Sean Barry ends up giving the sheriff permission to search his truck. He didn't have to. Mm -hmm. You know, he could have said, nope, can't search my truck. You have to come back with probable cause or, or a warrant. Well, he gives them permission to search the truck and the sheriff's department, they find blood on the underside of the truck. They also find tools in the truck and these tools, they, you know, we mentioned that wrench earlier. Other than the three gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, just like that wrench that they had found earlier, these tools are inscribed with the word or the name Barry on them. Right. So it's looking like that wrench came from this, you know, was is the missing piece from this set that they find in the truck. Yeah, because it's one thing for law enforcement to find, you know, a wrench that says Barry. We would all uh, assume where it came from, but you can't do that when you're in court. Right. So by finding these other tools with inside the truck, mm -hmm. then that's that's your connection that's where that's kind of uh undisputed evidence well yeah it, it takes a it takes a piece of evidence that was a little loosey-goosey and now it's some pretty hardcore substantial evidence i right believe. and then on top of that you have the blood evidence underneath the truck at some point and i'm i'm unclear who this was i believe it may have been sean barry though but i do want to point out that i'm i'm a little unclear who who did this, but at some point during the questioning, one of these guys says the N word to Sheriff rolls. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at that point, the sheriff, Sheriff rolls and Sheriff I, rolls is a white guy. Yeah. Yeah. But oh they, yeah. Yeah. But the, I guess so, we should point that out, but they're not directing it towards him. They're just saying it. That's okay. So I, I think it was Sean Barry, and I think when he was asked what he was doing the night before, he says something like, 
I was just trying to stay white. No, he says something like we, you know, me and the guys were riding around in our truck. And at some point we drove this right, person right. into town. This N word. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a, that if that's not a red flag, I, I, I got to tell you though, captain, I'm a huge fan of this sheriff rolls guy. I'm a big fan of this dude. Mm-hmm. So he quickly understands what he's dealing with. Right. You know, it's, it, he has an African American murder victim killed in one of the worst ways imaginable tortured. You have to say tortured cause that's yes. what it is. Mm-hmm. And it's starting to look like he was killed by these three guys, three white guys. And one of them is now using racial slurs during the questioning process. Mm -hmm. So it's now obvious to the sheriff that these guys, if they did this, they committed this murder simply out of hate and that these guys killed James bird jr. Just because he was black. Right. So sheriff rolls tells, tells Sean Barry, and this is why I think that word came from Barry because Rolls he's a real piece of shit. Well, Rolls is going to turn up the heat on Barry. Good. Okay. And so he wants him to squirm a bit because he's what he's, he's starting to see mm-hmm. is out of these three dudes. This is the guy that, that first of all, we have things connecting your truck to this situation. Right. We got you. You are already in the most heat. Mm-hmm. So now you either need to tell us what happened or, or we're coming at, we're coming at you, at you full go. Mm-hmm. And so to turn up the heat, he tells Sean Barry exactly how it's going to be from from this point on in the investigation. Sheriff Rolls tells Sean Barry, "I have called the FBI, and I can guarantee you one thing is for certain. The FBI is going to be taking this thing over. They're going to be taking a hard look at you." They are going to charge you with murder and you are going to be the first one they are talking to first thing in the morning. Well, and I think it's smart too. you. You come from such a small town. It's smart to turn this over to the FBI. This is this is something bigger. This crime is something bigger than Jasper. Mm-hmm. Well, once the sheriff threatens Sean Barry with getting the FBI involved and letting him know that they're going to be speaking with him first thing in the morning. Right. Well, that's all the encouragement that Sean Barry needs because now he's going to tell them what happened. And we can get into that tomorrow, the the evidence of the case, the details of the case, and then the trial as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a very difficult case to cover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Difficult, uncomfortable. Um, but it's this is a very important case. Mm-hmm. Anybody that remembers this case back from 1998, it was... I mean, it was national headlines because of how horrific the nature of the crime was, but also how we thought, and when I say we, I mean us as a nation. I've got to believe that that most of us believed that this was something that we, it's an embarrassing portion of our history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a part of our history that I personally am very ashamed of, but I think we thought as a nation that, that we were very far past this. Right. And it turned out that we were not. So as uncomfortable and as difficult as this case can be to report to everybody in the garage here, it's something that we shouldn't shy away from. It's important to discuss these things and it's necessary. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend and thanks for sharing on social media. We hope everybody has a good night and we will see you back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.